The court must hear the case. No more forum non-convenience. No more lease pendants. It's all about legal certainty and predictability. No other court is entitled to hear the case. So I cannot suddenly uh, sue you, say, in front of the courts in Texas, because I, I, I think that uh, I would get more damages out of uh, a Texan uh, uh, judge. And the resulting judgment uh, from the chosen court has to be enforced and or recognized and enforced in other contracting states, subject to a few minor uh, exceptions. Again, before you do business in another jurisdiction, before you invest in, a, in another jurisdiction, you want to know what are the rules of the game um, and how do you enforce uh, these rules. And to have this legal certainty and predictability uh, in terms of uh, the actual venue of uh, the litigation is something that is very, very important. Interestingly enough, the choice of court convention is also seen as an instrument that can uh, provide parties with a real alternative to arbitration. Arbitration is very important, of course. Arbitration very often is, 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 is done very well, professionally, and uh, in a very diligent way. But arbitration is becoming more and more expensive also. And arbitration is also becoming more and more, um, it takes more and more time to go through uh, an arbitration uh, process. And so some say, uh, and, and we would certainly join them, that the Choice of Court Convention does offer this real alternative, in particular for small and mid-sized companies um, for which arbitration is, 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 is not a real option simply because of cost uh, issues. And then finally, the Securities Convention, which is our finance law topic uh, that deals with um, transactions involving intermediated securities. I'm not going to uh, bother you with uh, the details of this convention as to what this actually means. Interestingly enough, the, the work on the Securities Convention was suggested by Australia, together with the UK and uh, the USA. Um, they proposed this topic as a new convention to uh, the Hague uh, Conference. And I was very pleased to hear, um, while I was here in Australia actually, that the US uh, Senate has just given its consent for the ratification of this convention. Um, we expect President Obama to deposit an instrument of ratification while he's still in office, which will mean that the convention will actually enter into force, uh, having reached the impressive level of three ratifications. Um, and we uh, certainly uh, hope that this will encourage other states, including Australia, to follow suit and then also look into this um, uh, convention. And then finally, the, 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 the second uh, pillar of uh, the resulting benefits uh, giving effect to human rights. What I like to do there is always to, to give the example of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child of 1989, which uh, is an almost universal uh, instrument which establishes key fundamental principles in uh, the field of child protection. A uh, child shall have co a continuing right to access to both parents. Um, every measure uh, taken with a view to protecting a child shall be taken in the best interest uh, of the child. Uh, adoptions should only uh, occur in the best interest uh, of, uh, of the child. Uh, states shall take measures for the effective recovery of maintenance obligations abroad, so on and so forth. That's all very good and nice and extremely important, but the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child doesn't come with any sort of machinery that would allow a state to give effect to these fundamental principles. And it's precisely by joining the Hague Child Abduction Convention, the Hague Adoption Convention, the Hague Child Protection Convention, the Hague, the new Hague Maintenance Convention or Child Support Convention, that a state does actually give real effect to uh, the fundamental principles uh, that are expanded in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, I think what distinguishes also the work of the Hague Conference from many other uh, legislative organizations is that, yes, of course, uh, we develop these uh, new uh, instruments and, uh, and rules, but we also care very much about their actual operation in practice. In other words, um, I strongly believe that it's one thing to put the conventions in this book, it's another thing to make sure that they really work in practice. And that's why actually most of the resources of the Permanent Bureau go into these what we call post-convention services, um, which include uh, you know, promotion, monitoring, uh, and what have you, but also providing 
technical assistance to member states in particular, uh, helping them with the implementation, with the proper implementation of the convention, and helping them or assisting them with the actual practical operation of the convention. And this access to technical assistance is for us, or for me certainly, actually the real reason why a state should become a member of the organization. As a member, of course, you are invited to all official meetings. You can co-determine with all other members the work program of the organization, you know, what is the next big topic uh, we should be working on. But as a member, you also have priority access to technical uh, assistance. We are receiving so many requests for technical assistance that we have to prioritize them. And what we do is really to serve our members first, which I think makes a lot of you can't be this um, universal or global organization with a tiny little office uh, in, uh, in The Hague. We all are only about 30 people working uh, in The Hague. Uh, I think it's uh, 31 FTEs as we, as we speak. Um, doing all this, uh, all this work, um, half of them are lawyers, half of them are, are support staff. Um, so a small but fine uh, team, a highly dedicated and motivated team. I always take, uh, I think, uh, you know, some, some pride and legitimate pride in saying that we are probably one of the most efficient organizations there is. Also, if you consider that our overall budget for all our operations is about 4 million euro, which is nothing for an intergovernmental organization. But uh, somehow we, we, we make it uh, work. Uh, but you can't, again, sort of be taken seriously, even as an international uh, organization that wants to be visible across the world with just the tiny little office in the Hague. That's why we opened a regional office in Buenos Aires in 2005 for Latin America. And because that was so successful, we then opened another regional office in Hong Kong in 2012. The basic purpose of these regional offices is to be closer to uh, relevant region, um, to have a better understanding of the needs of the region, uh, to be able also to offer better services and to have people from the region talking to people from the region as opposed to just having the guys from The Hague uh, coming and, and seeing their gospel as it were. Um, and you can easily imagine when you look at this map that um, we may have ideas as to where the next regional office uh, should be. Uh, Africa and the Middle East uh, are definitely uh, on, uh, on our list. And this is a uh, strategic plan that we hope to implement in uh, not too distant uh, future. Then certainly where does Australia stand in all of this with the conference? Uh, Australia has been a member since 1973, a very active, prominent and important member. As was uh, mentioned, Australia is party to currently 11 Hague Conventions. They are all listed there again. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that Australia plays a very active role in our major legislative project that is currently ongoing. We are developing a new Hague Convention on the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments in civil and commercial matters something really, really important, uh, something that I think the, the world, and certainly the, the commercial world, has been waiting for. It's surprising to know that something like this exists for arbitration, or has been uh, existing for arbitration for many, many years in form of the uh, New York Convention, but not so much for judicial uh, court decisions. Um, interestingly enough, this project, and again, I, I can't go into uh, too many uh, details here, but um, it has a history, it has, some would say, a loaded history. Uh, it all started in the 1990s already as a double convention, where we were asked to develop a new convention that would also deal with direct grants of jurisdiction and recognition and enforcement of judgments. That failed, um, mainly because it was just too challenging to develop a consensus-based solution for direct grants of jurisdiction. Um, that work initially then led to the Joseph Court Convention of uh, 2005 that I've been referring to. And a few years ago, uh, the members asked us to resume the work on the Judgments Project. Um, and we really encouraged them then to just focus on recognition and enforcement. Eventually, that message uh, went across and was accepted by our members. And so the future convention will only deal with recognition and enforcement of judgments. 
We will certainly resume work on direct grants of jurisdiction, but my, and now I'm taking off my hat as the Secretary General, my best guess is that work on direct grants of jurisdiction will take the form of soft law uh, again, because uh, it will be just too challenging in my view to uh, harmonize these rules uh, at the global um, but these are three other uh, Hague instruments or conventions that um, we would wholeheartedly uh, recommend uh, for ratification by the Australian uh, government. The Choice of Court Convention that I uh, referred to already. Um, the Choice of Court Convention was, by the way, also uh, the model that um, was used for your trans tasman regime uh, with uh, New Zealand when it comes to uh, the enforcement of uh, choice of core clauses that very much mirrors actually the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the principles of the choice of core convention. The securities convention, now that it is about to enter into force, I think should also be of uh, interest to the Australian government, uh, also because it's one of the original sponsors. And then the 2007 maintenance convention um, for the effective recovery of maintenance obligations abroad. I always like to say this is the next big thing in terms of uh, the family law uh, area for the uh, for the Hague Conference. I'm convinced that this will uh, be a, a big uh, a success, uh, another success of the Hague Conference. We are already at uh, 30 plus uh, contracting states. Um, hugely important and there are lots of studies that show that with every dollar that you invest in effective recovery of maintenance uh, obligations abroad, you get five, ten, twenty dollars back uh, in terms of uh, uh, maintenance uh, being effectively paid, which means that typically, say, the, uh, the model that uh, tries to enforce a maintenance obligation abroad doesn't have to turn to social services, for example, uh, to be able to meet both ends. Um, and uh, therefore, there is also a quite a strong financial interest for, for states to, to join this, uh, this convention. Um, I would not do justice uh, to uh, the subject matter of this presentation if I were to, uh, if I were not to mention some uh, names, actually, of uh, Australian officials who play a very important role uh, in our work. There you see Andrew Walter, Assistant Secretary at the uh, AT's Department. Um, I mention him because Andrew has been uh, a very a strong supporter of the work of the Hague Conference, a very active, diligent uh, participant in all of our world meetings. And at this year's Council on General Affairs and Policy, which basically is the highest organ of the organization, he was elected to become our next chair of the Council, so he will be the, the, the highest person in uh, the organigram of the uh, of the Hague Conference, he will take over uh, in March of uh, next year, and I very very much look forward to uh, working with him and implementing our work program. In addition to that, we have uh, Chief Justice Diana Bryant, who chairs a uh, a group. Uh, it's a working group. Um, we have working groups and experts groups, and one day someone will have to explain to me the difference between the two, because in my view, you are all experts when you uh, work on these, uh, these groups, but this is a very important uh, work that's going on relating to the Child Abduction Convention. We'll hear more about the Child Abduction Convention in a, in a moment, but uh, effectively the idea of the Child Abduction Convention, of course, is to send back the child as quickly as uh, possible following a wrongful removal by one of the parents in violation of a custody right of the other parent. There is an ex exception in the convention to this principle, Article 31b. The exception was originally designed as a really, really narrow uh, exception, basically only the case of grave risk, would you not send the child back? Um, the problem is that this exception has been applied more and more broadly across uh, the world, and there is a real danger that it sort of undermines the actual purpose of the convention. It was therefore time um, to develop a guide to good practice that is addressed to judges in particular, explaining to them how they should operate this, uh, this exception. And this really important work is chaired by Diana uh, Bryan. And uh, the work should be finished um, in the course of next year, hopefully, and will then have to be endorsed by our council. Then we also have Chief Justice James uh, Alsop uh, chairing uh, an experts group this time. Uh, on the use of uh, video link and other modern technologies and the taking of evidence abroad, that is basically work undertaken with a view to making the whole operation of the evidence convention more 
secure and more uh, effective. Um, that is ongoing work, and uh, we'll see how much uh, time we need to, uh, to finalize this, but this will also lead to uh, some sort of um, practical handbooks and, and, and uh, guides to good practices. And then uh, two colleagues uh, that I want to mention also, uh, my attaché, uh, Thomas John, uh, who used to work at the AG's uh, department uh, in Canberra, and Brody Warren, a former intern, a former Pete and I intern, I'm very uh, pleased to say, and uh, I'll get back to that in a minute, um, uh, who uh, loved the work at the Hay Conference so much, and we loved him so much that he decided to stay. Uh, and he works uh, in uh, service evidence, uh, obviously access to justice, and this type of work. And uh, the Pete and I internship is something that is very, very dear to my heart. I have had the privilege, uh, really, of uh, working with uh, Pete and I for uh, a few years. I'm very touched by the fact that Nicola and I is with us here today to talk about 